Ted Lerner is my nothing personal word of the day. Today is February 14th, 2023. Ted Lerner was the principal owner of the Washington Nationals and he passed away yesterday at 97. I met Ted Lerner for the first time when he came in and he was buying, I had a connection with him because in 2002, uh, Jeffrey Laurie has sold the Expos to Major League Baseball. The Major League Baseball ran the Expos for a couple of years and then moved the Expos to Washington and they became the Washington Nationals owned by Major League Baseball. And there was a stadium built, which is now Nationals Park. And then Ted Lerner bought the team and was approved. And I remember at the owner's meeting when we approved him, I had my opportunity to spend time with him. And he was, this is 20 years ago, so he was in his 70s and I was in my 30s. And I took an immediate liking to him. He was not only because he was Jewish, it had really nothing to do with that. And there aren't as many Jewish owners as you'd think in Major League Baseball. But it was, uh, I, I am attracted to relationships that remind me of a relationship with my grandfather. And Ted Lerner was very much like my grandfather. And we spent so much time together. We were in the same division. Uh, so I spent, I went to Washington every time the Marlins were there. And I sat with him every single game. We spent time every owner's meeting together. I would speak to him during the off season many times, his beautiful wife, Annette and we would talk about everything. He came in and struggled in the beginning because he ran the Nationals the way he had run his real estate business where they were keeping track of every expense and people were angry. They were partnered with Stan Kasten, by the way, who was uh, asked to be a part of that group as the president with someone with experience to help shepherd in the new era of Washington baseball. And that ended up in a divorce, of course. But at the end of the day, Ted Lerner, and his family was running the team. And Ted had so many questions about running a team and was interested in, in my life. I was interested in his life, a fascinating life that he had. But as I remember Ted Lerner, he died from pneumonia. Life's weird. I, I called him Wednesday and uh, he didn't answer. And that was relatively normal. So I didn't think anything of it because older people are not as you know, cell phone savvy or home phone savvy. You know, someone is old when you, your first order is to call them on their home phone, right? That's a sure sign. And then I got the news yesterday and Ted Lerner brought a championship to Washington in 2019. He gave up control of the team in 2018, but still very much that championship was about him and what he did for the city of Washington. In his box, every game, there'd be someone different from the world of politics, it, it would be very normal on a random Tuesday night against the Marlins to walk in and you'd see politicians. It would always interest me to talk to them. Ted had a philosophy about business, about family. We had very serious and deep conversations about children, about how to raise children, about how to ensure that your children, your Jewish children are marrying Jewish kids, not kids, but marrying Jewish people. And I wanna say, to you that if you think that uh, when a billionaire owner dies, it's great, you know, move on, or who cares about billionaires and they're a bunch of bad people, uh, you don't know Ted Lerner. Ted Lerner was a gentle man. Ted Lerner was a loving man. Ted Lerner cared more about family. He ran a business like a business. He loved baseball, but he loved me. And in a, in a in an industry where sometimes I was looked at as too forward or too direct or taking too many bullets for an owner or not taking enough or being too far out in public or doing levitard shows or all of the craziness, Ted always talked to me like a grandson and he would just tell me when he didn't agree with things I was doing or when he did, but he said, but I, I always love you, David. And we would end every game and every time we talked with I love you, and that doesn't happen a lot in baseball. And there's one, only one other owner I ever do that with and still do it to this day, and that's Fred Wilpon. And uh, when someone passes away, the funeral, when someone who's Jewish passes away, the funeral is immediately, the burial is immediately. And I've got shows today. I'm gonna go to DC tomorrow 
and uh, and pay a shiva call, which is when you spend time with the family and when you talk about their lives and laugh about their memories and celebrate their life. That's what you do in Judaism. You celebrate the life of those who pass, no matter how tragic the circumstances or no matter how untragic the circumstances. And a 97 year old passing away is not tragedy. So Ted, and I know you uh, enjoyed nothing personal. You enjoyed beating the Marlins as we enjoyed beating you. But I would like to say that I'll see you again, but I'm afraid you're in a place that will not grant me access. Thank you for not just being an owner of a baseball team, but for being a mensch and for teaching me what it is to separate baseball from life and baseball from love, something that I had a hard time doing during the course of my career. And I think about you every day, and I promise you that won't stop. To his wife, Annette, his children, I'm sorry for your loss and may his life forever be a blessing. Ted Lerner passes away at 97. This one hurts. Coincidentally enough, and I don't know how you transition away from death, but something I better get used to. Ted Lerner and I spent many hours, many hours talking about baseball and the extra inning games and how to make the sport better, how to make it more interesting, how to get more fans to games, how not to overpay players. Why Ted Lerner, and he and I would talk about Scott Boris all the time and how Scott Boris would always get him. Yeah, he got me again, that bastard. <laughs> that is true. You were like prey. You were putty in Scott's hands, Ted. Come on. I warned you, Steven Strausberg. Anyway, so we would talk about the rules of baseball pretty often. There's a rule that yesterday is now a permanent part of your life, my life, any baseball fan's life. It's called the ghost runner, and I'm not calling it that. I've told you that. I think on a previous episode I mentioned I'm not calling it ghost runner. He's not a ghost. I can see him. And it's not like a guy in a white sheet. It's just a player. And it's the last player who made the last out, or you can do a pinch runner to replace the player who made the last out. But it's pretty much that simple. It's damn little league rules. You put a guy in second base, and the biggest problem with the rule was solved when the union got its way. What do I mean by that? Do you know that in every play in baseball, it is a net zero financially for owners. Sounds weird, right? But let's think this through. When you're up at the plate and you drive a runner in, you get credit for a run batted in. The player who scores gets credit for a run scored. These are statistics that are used when thinking about value and payroll and salary. However, the pitcher who gave up the run gets an earned run against him, and that goes against his salary. And if it's an error and an unearned run, whoever got the error, that's a demerit against his salary. You can quantify what every play does economically. When you put a runner on second base, there was a fight that the union had, which is, well, how are we gonna deal with this? We've got to give the offensive player an RBI if the runner scores, and we're giving a run scored to that player who got on second base, not by earning it. And he even said, yeah, but what about the pitcher? It's not the pitcher's fault. When a pitcher gives up an inherited run, the earned run goes to the pitcher who put the runner on base. When a pitcher gives up his own run through a home run or gets his own runner on base and then the runner scores, it's an earned run. There's no way we're letting pitchers get charged with an earned run for this extra inning runner. And ownership gave in. So do you know that there is no earned run for the pitcher when the ghost runner scores? And I just called it the ghost runner when I promised her I wouldn't. When the runner on second scores, who got there through walking from the dugout, that's not an earned run for the pitcher, but the offensive player we agreed as an industry would get credit for the RBI. So the union then said, sounds good by us. The other reason the union was okay with ending games as quickly as possible 
is do you know how many players lose service time because of extra innings games? Extra innings games cause a GM and a president to be on the phone during the course of that game in extra innings to the traveling secretary. Where the hell's our AAA team? We got to get players ready. Pull the player. Get them ready for a 6 a.m. flight because we're going to need to make a player move. We're going to need a starting pitcher because we're going to have to warm up our starting pitcher here shortly, who's tomorrow's starting pitcher, who's going to have to pitch long on short rest because we have no more players to pitch. You're talking to your minor league player development people. You're talking to your player personnel people. Who's next? You're looking at how many options they have left. You're looking at your roster implications. There are players who you designate each year as they're the train. The train between AAA and major leagues. They're on the shuttle. They go back and forth all year long. They come up in a pinch when you need someone. You send them right back down as soon as you can when there's a, your, your main player is back ready to go. It's called the shuttle. There are times, there are players, you'd have to go back and look at the stats, Coke, and I don't have it off the top of my head. I bet you there's years where we sent the same player down five times. That's called being on the shuttle. Extra any games cause shuttles. Players don't like being shuttled. It interrupts their family. It interrupts their lodging situation. And oh, by the way, it interrupts their pay because the people on the shuttle have one rate when they're on a minor league team and one pay rate when the major league team because the major league minimum, which is what you get paid, let's say the major league minimum is $162,000. Just for fun, $1,000 a game. If you get called up for a game, you get paid $1,000 for that game. The minor league minimum is about 10 grand, let's say for fun, 10 grand a season, or let's say, Eight, let's say $1,000 a month. So let's say it's $100 a game. So when you play a minor league game, you get 100 bucks. That's a raise of 10 times to get called up for a day. So that's great for the players who get called up, not so great for the players who get sent down for the sole reason that they had to be used extra days and their arms about to fall off because of extra innings. So the union is not happy with the shuttle. The owners are not happy with the shuttle. How do you avoid the shuttle? Stop the games. Broadcasters, our biggest client, not your corporate sponsors, not your season ticket holders, your biggest client as a baseball team is your broadcast partner. Now, notwithstanding the fact that the broadcast networks are going bankrupt and that the entire world is changing, how you're watching games, the blackout rules are gonna be changed, it's all gonna be streaming, Major League Baseball is about to take over for all these bankrupt networks. Notwithstanding any of that, your biggest source of revenue is your broadcast partner. And that's nationally the same way too. If you speak to executives at Fox and ESPN and Turner and Apple, guess what? They don't want five hour games. No one sits and watches five hour games. They just don't. The ideal time, and I've not been able to get any of the lead execs at these stations to say this, but I really want them to. Two hours and 30 minutes, start to finish. They recognize games will be 240, 245. 306, 320, they don't like it. Two hours, 30 minutes, bing, bang, boom. Half hour pregame, 2.30, three hour window, thank you. The fact that this became a permanent rule yesterday was always going to happen. The reason why it had been year to year until now is that neither side during collective bargaining negotiations was willing to use it as a trade chip. When you are doing collective bargaining and there's an issue on the table that both sides agree to, you don't bargain it. And you don't acknowledge that you both agree to it. When it doesn't have to be part of a collective bargaining agreement, you punt it. You say, we'll go year to year. We'll put it as part of the joint competition committee, but there's no way that you're getting a concession because of an extra inning rule. And that's what the ownership said. And that's what the player side said. That's why here we are the next off season after the first year of the new CBA and this newly formed joint competition committee. Yes, the one with players and an umpire and it's still run by owners because they've got the majority. No surprise that rule is there. 
It doesn't change how you make up your team. It does not change anything. The other new rules in terms of speed and pickoffs and defensive shift, it will change for 29 teams, how they make up their team. The 30th team is the Marlins because they're the only team that now has 18 second basemen on their team and not taking into account the fact that it's a brand new way that rosters should be put together. But notwithstanding that, majority of teams are changing the way their rosters are. Lots of implications for the new rules. This rule, no roster implications whatsoever. There's another thing that is not getting as much press that is a big change, and that is something that is very important. I don't want to oversell how much ownership did not like position players pitching. They hated it unanimously. It was always 30 to zero. What do we do? Because it's embarrassing. There are position players who loved it. They enjoyed it. We had a list of position players who would volunteer. That's part of spring training. Who is going to be available and ready? Let's see you take the do a bullpen. Let's just see if by chance you won't embarrass yourself, myself, and your arm won't fall off, and you're not one of our highest paid players, and we're going to talk before the season starts in what circumstances we will allow our manager to throw a position player. I've told you the Ichiro story who so badly wanted to do it, and his manager at the time, Dan Jennings, let him do it in the final game of the season. You know that Albert Pujols wanted to do it, and his manager let him do it. All of those things are true, but in general, when looking at the game, position players pitching means bad. It means there's a blowout. It means that there is a lack of competitiveness, and it was always embarrassing for us to watch Sports Center or CBS Sports HQ because every time a position player would pitch, they would throw, they would show the highlights, and hitters hated facing position players. They all wanted to get pinch hit for. Why? Because it's embarrassing if you don't hit a home run. Can you imagine striking out or grounding out meekly to a position player? You never hear the end of it in the clubhouse. And players, especially this day and age, they don't want to be embarrassed on video. So yesterday, the rule changed. The only way a position player can pitch, if you are winning by 10 runs in the ninth inning, if you're up 10, no problem, put a position player in. Or if you're down eight, then you can pitch a position player whenever you want. So interestingly enough, why is that the rule? When you're up 10 in the ninth inning, the view is that other than playing in Philadelphia or Cincinnati, there's a pretty good chance that you're gonna win that game. If you wanna go a position player, by all means, but only for one inning, three outs, that's it. But we only are now gonna let you do it down eight, there's another dollar. They're only gonna let you do it when you're down eight because at eight runs, when you're down, let's say nine to one, there are people who would say, move on, the game's over. But in this day and age where people are getting down in the knob and there are three run home runs all the time, you're not out of a game down eight. So if you're gonna put a position player in when you're losing by eight and you're willing to give up and all of a sudden be down by 10, 12, 14, 16, 18 runs, then have at it. But we're gonna follow this year. There will not be a position player who pitches for a trailing team down eight earlier than the eighth inning even one time because there's too good a possibility. However small it may be, it exists that you can come back. And of course, the third time a position player can pitch is in extra innings. And the reason that had to be a rule and the reason the owners were okay with that as part of a rule and needed that as part of a rule is there are some baseball people who will say, no matter what, I am not gonna pitch my starter tomorrow's game, today's extra innings. I don't want him to pitch on early rest. I don't want him to pitch without his normal warm up. I don't want him to pitch at a time of day that he normally doesn't pitch, and I'm not willing to risk it. So therefore, as a team, you decide before a season starts, before a series starts, you talk about these scenarios and whether or not, if you've got your ace going on Saturday and there's an 18 inning game on Friday, you have made it clear to the manager before that game starts that you are not pitching that Saturday starter. You're not pitching your ace in the 14th inning of a game under any scenario. 
So if you need to go position player, need to go position player. There was not going to be a rule that would have allowed and made it so position players wouldn't get to pitch. It's all about injuries. Everything we do is trying to stop paying players not to play for us. That's the problem with the World Baseball Classic. That's what we've been fighting since the World Baseball Classic started, which is this amazing tournament that happens in March. We're petrified that our pitchers, more so than our position players, are going to get hurt. Because what it means is they are pitching at maximum velocity and stress and leverage in March. And their arms, no matter how good their off-season workouts are, no matter how early they report to spring training, their arms are not ready. The Yankees caught a break yesterday, and they're not going to think it's a break, and you're not going to think it's a break, and Team USA is not going to think it's a break. But Nestor Cortez has been pulled from the World Baseball Classic. He has a grade two hamstring injury. He therefore is off the team. Kyle Freeland was put on the team. And now the Yankees are faced with the possibility of Frankie Montas being hurt to start the season, Nestor Cortez being hurt to start the season, and they're stuck with Garrett Cole, Carlos Rodon, and Luis Severino. And then they'll have, they could have Herman pitch. They've got a little bit of depth in the rotation. But the Yankees believe Cortez will be ready for opening day, and I know what's going on in their front offices. They're not allowed to say it publicly. They're happy. I don't think they wanted Cortez pitching in the World Baseball Classic, no matter what they said publicly, because the risk is too great and they need him too much on the assumption that Nasty Nestor can be what he was last year, which, by the way, is dicey at best. Hamstring injuries are as scary as elbow and forearm tightness for a pitcher. Because if your hamstring is not working, and I'm coming off a torn hamstring, so I can tell you, if your hamstring is not working, it is very soon after that, that other parts of your body are going to hurt. Because you are going to change your mechanics in a way that will somehow make it easier for you to pitch pain-free or to run pain-free or to field pain-free. You are overcompensating, therefore creating opportunity for other injury. It's why when it comes to pitchers, man, we are so careful about lower body injuries and how we treat those and how we protect them and how conservative we are because a lower body injury that causes a change in mechanics guarantees an upper body injury. And that means you've got a 55% chance that it's elbow related, a 30% chance it's shoulder related, and then you know a 15% chance it's rib related or something. So Nestor Cortez is out. Who are the Yankees gonna get? Maybe Michael Waka? When you have an injured player, you meet with your GM and you make one of two things very clear. The first thing you make clear is whether or not there's any payroll room. Well, Yankee fans, do you know what your current payroll is? It's $292,480,000. Does that sound coincidental to you? Do you know what you don't wanna be right now as a Yankee? You don't wanna be going to spring training in Tampa and be a non-roster invite as a veteran who has a split deal. And we do this every year, you invite veterans, you invite them to spring training, and if they make the team, they get $2 million. And if they don't make the team, you release them, they get zero. And when you are doing your payroll, you assume a certain number of non-roster invites making the team. And you do not allow more than that to make the team because then you have blown past your budget. And you've already budgeted what your opening day payroll is going to be. You've budgeted what kind of uh, vigorous you may have at the trade deadline. You may have secreted away some money for the trade deadline, or you may be hoping for upside with your gate revenue if your team is competitive. So you've got a range of money that you're willing to take on at the trade deadline or an amount of money at the deadline that you have to shed because you didn't play as well or you didn't get the gate revenue that you thought you would get. All of that is accurate. But when you've got a spring training injury, one of the things you think about is, all right, are we now gonna add a non-roster invite? Are we gonna trade for a replacement? Do we know how serious the injury is? If Nestor Cortez starts on the disabled list, that does not count for your quote 26 man payroll, but the guaranteed money does count for luxury tax. So therefore the Yankees only have $520,000 until their next threshold which coincidentally is called 
the Steve Cohen threshold. And there's one thing the Yankees don't want to do, and that's cross the Steve Cohen threshold. So at 292.48, they don't have a lot of wiggle room to add. So if you're all thinking that the Yankees are about to add a starting pitcher, a $5 million, a $7 million, $8 million starting pitcher, I've got a surprise for you. They're not. They're going to nurse Nestor back to health and hope that he's ready for opening day and not have to worry in any way about the World Baseball Classic as it relates to Nestor. All right, we come back. We're going to review a movie that I absolutely adored, not because of how great the movie was, but because of how great the story was. And then we're going to talk about something going on on college campuses that is uh, quite, quite upsetting. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Nothing Personal. It's David Sampson. Thank you. Please go to Nothing Personal with David Sampson YouTube channel. Hit subscribe. We're waiting to get to 12,000. Someday someone will explain to me why our YouTube page does not grow faster. Maybe we need to do something viral. Maybe I'll do a show naked or something. Would that help, Coca? Would that hurt? Would people turn away? Maybe I need to have some sort of hot take, like baseball sucks. No, I would never say that. I love it. LeBron James isn't even the second GOAT. He shouldn't have been to the Super Bowl if he's not going to play in the game. Is that, will, will that, how about that? Is that viral? Can you create viral without like going to some sort of house of ill repute? Hmm. Tom Brady stinks. <laughs> so ridiculous. I don't even get that. What am I, do I have to like throw a compact disc into a compact disc holder at 30 feet using a green screen and putting it on a string but making it look like I sat there for hours doing it? Is that viral? True spirit. When I was 16 years old, 1984, here's what I was focused on. What are the chances that the girl I'm currently looking at will let me in any way ask her out that could possibly lead to any base. That's the truth. That's what I was thinking about. It did not occur to me that I wanted to get into a sailboat and sail around the world. Nope, didn't occur to me. Did not occur to me that I had to worry about anything other than how to be popular, how to be liked, how to not be made fun of, and how to not be every beautiful girl's best friend, but more. That's what you think about. That's what I was thinking about. I don't know what you think about. I'm telling you, honestly, that's what I was thinking about. Today's Valentine's Day, by the way. Coca, quick side story, I'm sorry. Quick side story. In, at Horace Mann, the high school where I went, there was something in grade school uh, and in middle school where there were paper Valentine's cards where you went to the store and you bought little things in little envelopes and it would say, Happy Valentine's Day or Will You Be My Valentine? And they did a, a program where you would write out Valentine's Day cards to different people, different girls, different boys, whoever, and then you would give it into the uh, um, authorities at school and they would walk around and deliver these Valentine's Day cards to each classroom during the course of a day. And there'd be multiple deliveries in multiple rooms. There is no greater social anxiety, as bad as social media is now, and the fact that there's bullying going on and people, kids are, are losing their lives because they're being bullied on social media. And if that doesn't get addressed soon, we are going down a road that we may not recover from. But the anxiety that I felt and many others, when the door opens on Valentine's Day and there's a stack of cards and they're handing them out like mail call in a war and you're sitting there waiting and waiting and you're watching the numbers dwindle and you've gotten two and you're looking around and they've got eight, he's got nine, she's got 12. And you're wondering if I send a bunch, will I get them later? So I would do all my Valentines to all the girls early in the day, hoping that they'd be like, I better return the favor. So I would expect later in the day to get more than I would get earlier in the day. A total sense of tension manufactured by Hallmark. It's why I don't like Valentine's Day. I don't like it. I don't like that feeling. I still think about that feeling of watching the door open and wondering how many, if any, I would get. And then you read them and wonder, ooh. And then you realize it was just a reciprocal action. 
So at 16, you just start worrying about different sort of things. But Valentine's Day, it's like New Year's Eve. Do you want to be alone? Do you not want to be alone? If you are alone, do you pretend it's okay to be alone? And you say, I'm happy to be alone, even though you'd like to be with someone. You want to be someone's Valentine. And if you're the third wheel, or if you are sort of the other person in a relationship, you know there are certain days where you're paying the price for being the other person because you're not going to be with the person you want to be with, even though you'd like to be with them, or maybe you don't and then you are, or you wait for the text, or you wait for the phone call, you all know what I'm talking about. Say what you will, but you know it. It's Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's Day. <laughs> the movie I watched yesterday, or the other day, I don't know when I watched it, Coca, but in the last few days, it's called True Spirit. True Spirit is the story of Jessica Watson, who's a 16-year-old New Zealander or Australianite, I think she's an Australian New Zealander who decided as a sailor, she was going to circumnavigate the globe, do a transoceanic crossing alone at 16. The parents were almost attacked by the Department of Social Services. People were despondent that they would let their 16 year old girl do that. But they did. And it's the story of her awesomeness. And I just would like to just mention as you watch True Spirit, and you think about what you would allow your child to do or not, some of the greatest accomplishments are done by children who have a passion for something and will never know what could result because parents quash that passion because it's not theirs, or parents quash that passion because they're not willing to take the risk or have the worry. Anna Paquin, the former Academy Award nominee, plays the mother from the piano, that's a movie to check out. It's called True Spirit. It's uplifting, it feels good, and the story is fascinating. All right, Coca, play me some music. You know what I want? <laughs> I want to talk to Samson. So you want to talk to Samson. Yes, indeed. Get on my Twitter, David P. Samson, ask a question, and if it's topical, you're in. David, can you walk me through the process of canceling your basketball team season the way NMSU did? It's a pretty simple question. I appreciate that question and we're gonna talk about it. New Mexico State is a university. They had some problems and in order to treat the problems, they canceled the entire season. They didn't suspend players, they just had them all leave. About a month ago, there was a New Mexico State University player involved in a shooting. That player was taken away from the team. Well, about a week ago, every single coach and assistant coach for NMSU was put on administrative leave because the players were engaged in hazing. They were hazing each other. We've talked about hazing, you've heard about hazing. Hazing is when college students or high school students or anybody at any workplace, when you believe that the right of initiation into a club or the right of initiation into, it's code red from a few good men. Did you order the code red? You're goddamn right I did. Hazing could be do burpees, do push-ups, drink until you vomit run naked across the quad like your Will Ferrell in old school. I'm not sure when hazing became, pull your pants to your ankles and let me touch your ball sack. Really? Well, the university had no choice but to take that seriously. Why? Because the player who got hazed actually brought it to the attention of the administration and said, I really am not that interested in having my teammates bully me pull my pants down and touch my private parts. The president of NMSU speaks to the bo board, chairman of the board, speaks to the athletic director, speaks to constituents and boosters, and they realize that putting the coaches on admin leave was not enough. They need to clean up their house. We all need to clean up our houses. This level of acceptable behavior has changed so much over the years of what we consider to be okay. In what world do students think it's okay to put someone's life 
or level of self-respect in jeopardy so that you may feel good about the powerful position you have because you're a part of something that someone else wants to be a part of. You think it's cool? Like all the fraternities and sororities who are doing hazing? Hey, stay up all night and run through the quad naked and drink till you puke. Oh man, you have alcohol toxicity, poisoning, you're dead. Christ, I guess we went too far. Maybe we shouldn't have done the 80th shot of vodka and mixed it with a little pill while getting stoned. I mean, I don't agree with hazing academically, right? Where there's a club, if you don't get an A on this paper, you're not allowed in. And once you get in, we're gonna make you study for 24 hours straight. I don't agree with hazing of any kind. And the reason I don't agree with it is because why should you make people feel worse about wanting to be part of something that you think feels cool that I guarantee you 10 years from now, you won't give a crap about? It's the most bizarre thing. And it all goes back to grade school, wanting to get the Valentines, wanting to be cool, wanting to be in the cool crowd. And when you're not, you become in the uncool crowd and you wanna make that cool. Or maybe you dye your hair or pierce your ears or start getting tattoos or speaking up in class or becoming a class clown or getting kicked out of class, drawing attention to yourself. How many times do your kids who don't get enough attention get negative attention and do negative things to get negative attention? And that's when you give them attention. You've heard the expression, a greasy spoon gets the wheel. That is definitely not the expression. I certainly have mixed my metaphor, but the point is we had a system with the Marlins and I think back that I'm a participant in this. We would have players sign balls during spring training and we would give them to our customer service department, many of them. That was one department who would get them. And the rule was simple depending on the level of anger of the complaint and how right you think they are to have that complaint, you answer that complaint with an autograph ball. If the person's complaint you think is not worthy, then you can offer them a ticket or a coupon to get a free hot dog. But we left it up to our customer service and our sales department to decide what level. And it was always the worse the complaint, the louder the complaint, the more often the complaint, the better the price. What a weird society where the, the more you complain about ridiculousness and the more annoying you are, the more apt you are to get free miles or a free ticket or a free meal or a free night at a hotel or whatever the case, a free dessert. Hey, my food's cold. Hey, there's a fly in my soup. It's sort of harmless, but it's now been parlayed into the fact where negative behavior has become cool in so many places. I'm not sure I understand what the inflection point was, where it was and why it was. I'm not sure where it became okay, where students, however they were raised, however unprivileged they were, privileged they were, whatever color, creed, ethnicity, I don't care. Tell me where the background is, where you say, you know what? I'm gonna pull down this kid's pants and I'm gonna touch him. We'll see how that goes. We'll make him part of our cool club. I don't wanna be part of that club. And the administrators at New Mexico State, what choice do they have? They're running a program that is an absolute embarrassment. You tell the boosters, forget it, we're gonna put your money elsewhere. You call your conference commissioner and you say, you can, we'll forfeit the rest of our games. We're happy to vote for whatever you want in terms of how to seed everyone for the conference championship. Of course, the question that's being asked is the team stunk so badly, would a good team with the number one team in, in basketball, would they cancel their season with the NCAA tournament coming up? If you had that level of hazing, you don't wanna hear my answer to that. Highly unlikely. Yesterday at Michigan State, there was a shooting Michigan State got together and they have canceled their next two days of anything on campus, including all of their sports, including all of their games. A non-affiliated 43-year-old went into an academic hall and then into a student union and killed people last night. We don't have information whether it's an assault weapon, but if it is an assault weapon, I just, I'm gonna ask again. I'm gonna ask as many times as I have to. I'm just curious if you could get to me and I'm happy for you to get in my Twitter, I really am. I'm happy to have the debate. 
I am waiting for someone to explain the Second Amendment to me where it says that we have the right to have assault weapons. I'm just, I need to know. I'm just curious about it. Today is the five-year anniversary of something that happened in where I lived, Parkland. Five years. There was activists, there's people trying to effectuate change. There was my ill-fated attempt to try to get people to vote and effectuate change. During the State of the Union, there's people not applauding for banning assault weapons. I guess it's not cool if you're a Republican. You guys don't even know what I am, but you know where I am on guns. My child's in college right now. He's been in lockdown at Yale twice. Michigan State, Wisconsin, where I went, which is the best school in the country, by the way, by far. Not even a question. I don't know why Wisconsin isn't ranked first, because it should be. I just would like to ask, as you think about your political position, you think about where you stand and you think about why you stand there. I'm just curious what your reason is. I'm curious why you think that people need assault weapons who aren't in the military. It's not stopping anytime soon. Are we numb to it? Do we even care anymore? Is it just a breaking news alert that you look at your phone? Tell me what you did when you saw the breaking news alert about the Michigan State shooting last night. What'd you do? You said, God damn it again. And went on with your day. Hey, look, another civil war in Rwanda. Pass the broccoli. We're numb to it. That's great. Bet you're not numb to it once it happens in your family. Okay, Coca. I, whatever. One more thing. One more thing about this, if that's okay. I think we're running out of time, but I, I got one more thing for you. When you are on a board at a school, and I've been a part of two boards at two universities, you spend time thinking about academia. You spend time thinking about what kind of programs you're trying to do for your, for your students and you spend a huge amount of time figuring out campus security. Hours, you have presentations, you have coordination with local police departments with on-campus security. You do active shooter drills. You have students who you teach what to do when, not dissimilar to what happened 50 years ago when people were thinking about a nuclear attack and under your desk. And the effectiveness of the active shooter training for students is about that effective. Get under your desk, you'll be fine. Lock yourself in place. And what we did is at these board meetings, we'd have people come in and they'd train us and they'd tell us what the training would be to professors, what the memos would be. We'd go over the memos. Here's what students are gonna get during orientation. Here's the classes you have to take to graduate. Here's your major. And here's what to do if there's an active shooter. We do active shooter trainings at ballparks. You do trainings for CPR, for heart attacks. There's all these sorts of trainings. Some things are unavoidable. What happened to Hamlin? Foul balls hitting people. Accidents, biking accidents, kids getting run over, kids texting and driving kids drinking and driving, kids getting alcohol poisoning, all the different things that can happen. We spend time trying to teach kids the best they can to avoid situations where they have control over their own future, over their own present. And then we get to the active shooter part. Do we wanna put metal detectors in every building? Do we want security in every building? Do we want armed people in every building so no one can access the building and we're patting everyone down? And what we always said is no, because we don't have the money, we're not gonna put it in the budget because if we put that in the budget, that means we're firing three teachers, getting rid of a tenured spot. And on top of that, we're not allowing for this level of academic or athletic interest for the kids and the students. So we're not gonna do that. So what we do is we choose the risk of death on campus because we weren't willing and nobody is, and you're not either. There is a level of expense that you're not willing to undertake. There's a level of inconvenience you're not willing to undertake. And the reason you're not is because of money and comfort. And then you wake up, you get a text alert, and you say, God damn it, 
we have to call parents right now because their kids died on our watch. And you know what will change in next year's budget at the universities? Nothing. And the reason it won't is because there is a level of risk that we were always willing to entertain until it happens to us. And once it happens to us at our school, what we said is, we'll worry about it then. We'll change the rules then. We'll spend the money then. We'll allocate the resources then. But in the meantime, let's spend time trying to figure out a political change, a political solution. Let's see if we can ban assault weapons. I'm sick at the decisions that I've been a part of at it, running a baseball team. Everything I've done. And I'm not going to change. I'm sick of how I was. I'm sick of how I am. And I'm sick of how we're all going to stay. All because when we look at a text alert, we swipe left. This is nothing personal.